what I, what's on my heart right now is this coming Thursday is what we consider the day that Jesus went to heaven. And it's 40 days after Passover or after Easter, I believe. And then the 50, 50 days after was Pentecost. And Pentecost was a was a uh, a feast that they already practiced before the Holy Ghost fell on the disciples at Pentecost. Pentecost was was uh, there's a, there's a there's a Jewish there's a Jewish principle that 50 days after. The person dies. Like if your dad would die, 50 days later, the inheritance would be would be uh, measured out. And so, 50 days after Jesus died, the inheritance to the disciples and to everybody that was faithful was was measured out. And so, I believe that there's a there's a uh, correlation here that the Holy Ghost was an inheritance from Jesus. And, and when the Holy Ghost fell on the people at Pentecost, it says that they were in one accord at one place. And then this released. And so I believe that there, that, that is powerful. One accord in one place. I, from what I understand is they started off with about 500 people. And they ended up with 120 if we would be in a room from a, like 10 days in a room, could we even do that right now? If Jesus would tell us to wait on the Holy Spirit, we have no idea what that means or how long it's going to take. Would we be in a room with each other for 10 days or would we say, you know what, I got work to do. I'm going to go to work. And I believe that that's what they were facing. They didn't know that it's going to be 10 days. We're, we're looking back on it and seeing it was 10 days. They didn't know how long it's going to be. So when, when the 120 came to unity, full unity, so when this released, it's what, I, it's what I understand. And so I want to go back to... In, in the garden when Jesus was struggling so much that his sweat became as blood. You know, I, I believe that the struggle that we go through is not a struggle against darkness as much as it is a struggle to surrender ourselves to God. Jesus struggled in that one place and he was struggling to say, not my will but yours be done. But when he said it, he meant it. How many of us say that, but then when the real test comes, we still hadn't actually surrendered? When Jesus surrendered completely to the Father in the garden, he struggled like, he struggled like I don't know if anybody else in this earth ever struggled before. But once he decided that, it was, it was done. And his, when he said... When he said, not my will but yours be done, it was not my will but yours be done. He did not struggle the day that he was being crucified. He did not struggle the day that he was being beat. He struggled before that. And so I believe that our struggle, we, the enemy tries to tell us that our struggle is because darkness is so powerful. When in fact our struggle is that we don't want to die. We don't want to surrender to God. That is our struggle. And so that, that is a real struggle because Jesus kept asking God, if there's another way, I, I want that other way. If, if, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And so I, I do believe that it was a real struggle for Jesus, and I do believe that it's a real struggle for us. But if we know what the struggle is, I believe it's going to be easier for us to surrender and submit than if we don't know what the struggle is. If we believe that we're just one of these mistakes that God made and we have to struggle because of it, we will come out with a wrong answer. If we know that the struggle is a struggle to submit and surrender ourselves completely to God, 
then we will start focusing on overcoming that instead of trying to overcome ourselves or overcome the mistake that we believe God made or trying to overcome the power of the devil. When I believe that Jesus cut that power of the devil and when we submit to him, we also have authority to walk in that freedom. And so, so Jesus died... When did he actually die? Did he die in the garden or did he die on the cross? And the answer is both. At, in the garden, he died to self. He surrendered completely to God. And then after he surrendered completely to God, then he walked it out in the natural, what he already did in the spirit and in his soul. And so you don't read that when he was really being physically tortured, that he struggled. I mean, he, he, he had to push through physically, but I don't think mentally he struggled. He did that in the garden before the physical pain actually happened. And I believe that that is a metaphor for us, that we, our biggest struggles in our, in our emotion, in our mind, in our decisions, in our head, Deciding what we want and what we will and will not do. If we will, if it's an option to, if it's an option to, if it's an option to compromise, then we will compromise. If it's an option in our minds to compromise, we will compromise. Because when the, when it gets really really tough, to the point where our sweat would become like blood. I'm telling you, it will be easier to compromise than to stand if we do not close all doors to compromise and, clo and, and just decide, you know what, we are going with Christ, period. I want to say this again. If it is an option in your mind, in your life to compromise, you will compromise. Got, because that area is darkness that we're in agreement with and that belongs to the enemy and he will use it. And so Jesus made a decision and when, when, that, was full, when, that, when, when that was settled in his heart, when that decision was settled in his heart, that's when his physical trials happened. And when his physical trials were happening, he was not struggling. He was going through it physically, but he was not struggling. I believe he was compl at complete peace. Mentally at complete peace, emotionally and spiritually. And so he went through, and he went through, and the enemy, and he died in the natural, but he had already... He had already come full of life in the spirit and in the, in the soul. I believe his, his fight was, he, he already had overcome in the spirit because he came down from heaven, from the spirit. He laid down his, his Godhead and he was on a mission to overcome the soul. He, as a man, he was on a mission to overcome all the feelings, all the, the belief systems as a man connected to God. And when he overcame this, he made a way for us to do this with a connection to God. But then he also made a way to be empowered in that, which is the power of the Holy Spirit that will empower us to do the right things. And so I believe that a lot of us are struggling going through life trying to trying to maintain the connection to God, but we are not being empowered by something way deep in us to overcome with ease. Once the Holy Spirit hits you, you will overcome with ease something that you struggled and struggled and struggled with before. And I believe that there's various levels of these things. Some people have overcome in certain areas and not in other areas. But I'm here to tell you that it is possible to overcome in all areas. And when we believe it is not, we already made a, a, an agreement with compromise. If we believe that there's any area that we cannot overcome or that God cannot come through in, 
That is, that is a belief system of compromise. And, and we cannot die if we have an option of compromise. We cannot die to self if there is any option of compromise. It is impossible to die to self. Because we will, in the, in the time of crisis, we will go with compromise. If it is an option. Because at the point of death is the crucial point. At the point of death to self is the crucial point that if we have any open doors, if we have any kind of, of, of plan B's in our back pocket, we will go with plan B before we die to self. And so, so Jesus died. He took all mankind's sins with him to the cross. He died. And then he resurrected. God resurrected him. Do you, can you imagine the trauma that those disciples went through? They thought he's the king that's going to come and make them free, liberate them. And here he dies. What did they have left? What did they have left to do? And they didn't realize, but he was telling them that he is going to die. And they kind of missed it because they didn't want to think about that. They didn't want to, they didn't want to go there. And so they're going through life, and all at once he's on the cross, and he died, and they're like, what are we going to do? Peter said, I'm going fishing. And so he went fishing, and they, the others went with him, and they fished all night again like they had done the first time that Jesus met them, and they caught no fishes. And he told them again to put their nets on the right side of the boat. What does that mean like in our life? What does it mean to put the net on the right side of the boat versus the way we always did things? I believe it's, 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 it's a reminder to us that God's ways are not always our ways and we keep doing these things all, the, the same, same way. But if Jesus breathes life into us and tells us to do it another way, and we follow that, we will have so many fishes we can't pull them all in. I believe that. Because that's a biblical metaphor that is still relevant today. We can get caught up in this repetitious thing, doing things the way we've always done them, over and over and over. And all at once Jesus says, do this. And we're like, how would that work? That won't work. We're, fisher we're the professional fishermen. Who do you think you are? But the moment that they did that, the moment that they, they understood his voice and obeyed his voice, he commanded the fish to flow into their nets. It's, it's not as much about knowing everything as it is about knowing him and doing what he says. He will help you catch your opportunities. There's opportunities in our life that the door might be open for this opportunity today, and that's the only day in your whole life that that opportunity was open. And if you don't hit that opportunity, that day you missed it for eternity. And it doesn't mean that you are now condemned because you missed it. It just means you missed an opportunity that would have made your life so much easier and quicker and faster and it would have set the wheels in motion for your life to go a certain other way than for this way. And if we ask him and repent and align again, he will send more opportunities. And it might be that somebody else took that opportunity because we didn't. But there, there are certain things. And if we can hear his voice and walk with him and stay, in pe and stay with him, we will start seeing a lot more opportunities than if we are trying to do our same re repetitious thing and making ourselves believe that it doesn't matter. If we're going through life trying to figure Christianity out and trying to make a method and trying to figure out if I would do this and God would be pleased and if I would do that, then he would not. That type of thing, we will get off on the wrong track. 
This is not a method. This is a kingdom. This is a, this is a, uh, a king that is walking with us and he is showing us things. Jesus Christ is a king. He's king of kings. He puts us in charge on the earth as a king. And he is the king of, our, of kings. And this is not about a, if you do this, then, then, I mean, there is sowing and reaping, but it has to do with lining up with Jesus, and then you sow and reap. You sow what he wants us to sow, and, you, and we reap what he wants us to reap. And so there's definitely sowing and reaping. There's definitely, there's definitely, if we're doing, trying to do our own things, we will reap the, the results of that. But Jesus wants a connection with us, and he wants to tell us what to do, and he wants us to quit compromising and do it. And so, Jesus had never died before he died on the cross. He had never died. All he had was a promise from God that he's going to resurrect him. We also never died until we die. And we have a promise that God will resurrect us. He had the same thing we did. He never died before. How did he know that God's going to resurrect him? I think he had to struggle through it and come to the point where he decided, you know what, even if he doesn't, I will still trust him. It's like the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, they said, our God is able to save us from this fire. But even if he doesn't, we will still not bow to that idol. That was an idol of compromise in their day that they decided not to bow to. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, it was an idol of compromise that he decided not to bow to. He decided, he could have, they said you can't pray to any God but the king. And Daniel could have said, you know what, I'll just go into my little room, close the door, and pray to God. But he didn't do it because he felt like that was compromise. He opened his windows like he did every day before, and he prayed to God that everybody could see him. I'm not compromising. I'm doing what God wants me to do. You know, we can, we can, we can tell ourselves Oh, we can just do this little thing over here and this thing over here. It doesn't really matter that much, but it's the, it's the intention of the heart. Is there fear connected? Is there faith connected? Is this what we believe God wants? Or is this something we're doing trying to preserve ourselves from dying? It's easy to get caught up in this thing to decide that, you know, we're, we're just going to make it look all spiritual and do this thing over here. But if Jesus isn't in it, it's not spiritual. Not the right spirit. So Jesus dies and God resurrects him in a powerful way. This is when we die to self and we actually give up to God. All at once, we're empowered in such a way that we didn't know possible. That is the same principle. We are experiencing death, burial, and resurrection. And, and we have all experienced it in certain ways, I believe. But there's probably some other ways that God wants to do it yet. In a greater manner. In a greater way. And so... So Jesus came and he, he was walking and talking with them for 40 days after he resurrected, before he floated away like a helium balloon. At least that's what I would think. It's just like all at once he just floated away like a balloon that you just let go of. But... Did his physical body actually float straight into heaven? Yeah. And then, he, and then the angels were sitting there saying, why are you staring towards heaven? What, we should, I mean, of course they were looking. I mean, if, if you let a balloon go, you're, you're apt to watch it till you can't see it anymore. 
And so they're so intently watching Jesus float away, they didn't notice the angels until they looked around. The angels were like, why are you staring at the, up to heaven like that? Then they said, this Jesus that you saw go to heaven this way is going to come back this way. Which to me seems like he's actually going to come back in a physical body like they saw him go. And I don't believe that he's coming to be crucified again. I believe he's coming as a victorious lion. And how many people in the church, in the Christian church, like to talk about the lion? How many people are okay as long as you talk about the lamb? I mean, he's a lamb and a lion. How many people like to, like to discover what a lion actually is? What the lion of Judah actually is? What the lion of Jesus actually is? It's not a... It's not a passive... Look, and so he floats away to heaven, and they get asked, why are you staring, and can you imagine if you go into, into those shoes yourself, how you would feel? This, this was a, at first when he came back, they thought he was a spirit because he had just died. And how can a, how can a uh, person that just died show up? How can he just show up? I mean, if, if uh, somebody that had died would show up here, we would believe we're seeing a spirit. And then he said, bring me something to eat. And he started eating it to show them that this body that they're seeing is not just a facade, it's actually a natural being. How, how in their cognitive mind were they supposed to process all this? Exactly. How do you go through walls if you actually have a natural being? But there's actually science for that. There's actually science for that. Yep. What is it? Quantum physics or something similar. Can you <laughs> I, can, I can't. But I can tell you that like a cell phone like this, I can call somebody without any wires attached across the globe. I can talk to my girls when they're in Africa with a phone that I don't have connected to anything, any wires, and they have a phone that they don't have connected to any wires, and we can talk just like that with each other. What is that? It's quantum physics. So uh, there, there, is, there is technology in the natural realm right now that is available in the spirit realm that we're not tapping into. And it takes faith. It takes, faith is not just some wishful thinking. Faith is not just something that you try to grab out of the air. Faith is something that you fully expect. Faith is something tangible. Faith is evidence. Faith, like, like if, I, if I think about driving from here to where we live, I can imagine every road right now, Every corner, every, uh, every detail from here to there. I have faith. I have faith that it's still there, but I can't see it right now. I still have faith because I've been that way before or somebody else has been that way that says it, that's where it is. That's, that's, how, that's how I believe faith works. Faith is not just something that you grab somewhere. Faith is something that God speaks into your heart or you have been that way before and you know that it's still that way.
if somebody tells me that there is a, a certain thing at a certain place and I trust them and I believe them, I can have faith for it before I see it. Once I see it, I don't need faith for it. I already I, I see it now. But faith, faith in, my, in my opinion, faith is us reaching our hand up to God in faith and Him, when He puts His hand down of grace, when that connects, there's power. It's not just nothing. It is something. It is power. It's, it's, if we don't have faith, that point of connection won't happen. It's, a, it's, a, it's an engagement on our part to trust God, even when it seems like He's untrustworthy. It's an engagement on our part. If God puts his hand down this far and I refuse to put my hand up here and meet him there, we will not have a connection. God will not do it all. He already did it all in the spirit realm. Jesus did it all. Right now he wants some engagement from us. But you know what? We're not going to do it all either without him. We're not going to figure out a method to manipulate him. We're not going to figure out a method that's going to work aside from a connection to Him. We're not going it, to, it's not going to work. We're not going, the flesh will never get it done. A, princi a, a, a uh, re repetitive principle, a ritual, all these things. If you can use a ritual to help you connect to God, then that's for the connection. It's not, that ritual will not make it, you, you can do all kinds of good things. If it is not connected to God, then it is not connected to God. There's a lot of predators, a lot of people that take advantage of other people. They do a lot of godly principles to manipulate but it's not God. It's darkness. We can use godly principles. We can use good things to manipulate. We can do good things to advance the enemy's kingdom. If we focus on methods and if we focus on doing it for self, if we focus on doing it for self, we are empowering the enemy. We're empowering darkness. If we focus on doing it for God, we can connect to God and we can advance the kingdom for God in light, in power, in resurrection power. But if we do not die to self, we will be selfish. If we do not die to self, we will act selfish. If we do not die to self, we are empowering the enemy. If we do not die to self and live for God, we are empowering the enemy. If we do not die to ourselves and live for God, we are making this world worse, not better. Even if we try to tell ourselves, oh, we're doing a whole lot of good things. We're doing a whole lot of good things and we're screwing a whole lot of people's minds up by doing this if we do not do it for God. We will confuse people. We will confuse people to the point where they might not even want God anymore. If we do things selfishly with godly principles not connected to God and not dying to self, we will confuse people. We will confuse ourselves. If we do not die to self, die to God, submit to God, surrender to God everything, then we are opening the door for compromise and we're opening the door for us to advance the enemy's kingdom. I want to read in Mark 16. It 
It says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, him meaning Jesus, in the tomb. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. The stone was really big. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, clothed in a white, long white garment, and they were affrighted. They were afraid. He said unto them, Be not afraid, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. Tell his disciples and Peter. Peter compromised the night that they, just before they crucified Jesus. Peter compromised when he said, I don't know him. They said, go tell his disciples and Peter. They did not call, specifically the angel in the sepulcher did not call Peter a disciple. If we have compromise in our life, that is an option. We are not his disciple. I believe that. I believe we can be his disciple if we allow him to teach us. If we do not allow Jesus to teach us, we cannot call ourselves his disciple because his disciple means that we are following him. And we're taking instructions from him. And if we're selfish and we're doing our own thing, how can we call ourselves disciples of Jesus? We can call to God for grace, that he will cover us with grace at that point. But we cannot ask him for favor at that point. Favor is a, a release of God. God will release favor onto, onto his children that obey his commandments or his will or his ways. Grace is what you extend to somebody that doesn't deserve something. And you give it to them anyway. If you have an employee that works for every hour that he wants to be paid, when you pay him, that's called favor. He received favor. When you have an employee that is half of the time goofing off and not getting his work done, and you pay him anyway, that's called grace. Because he did not deserve everything that you paid him for, but you paid him anyway in hopes to win his trust. The, the, the reason for grace is Jesus came as a lamb. Jesus came with grace to help us trust him. He did not come to empower our sin or to empower our dysfunction. Jesus did not come to empower our sin or empower our dysfunction. He came to give us grace so that we trust him so that he can come in with the lion and say, don't do it. And if we do it anyway, we don't trust him. If we do it anyway, then we can't call ourselves a disciple of his. We can ask him for grace at that point, but we cannot, we cannot expect favor. When God releases favor on your life, it means that it's something that you deserve because you obeyed. It's something that you deserve because you're connected to him. It's something that you deserve because you are walking with God without compromise. If you're not walking in that area, you can ask for grace and ask him to help you get rid of all darkness that is keeping you from walking in favor. And at, his grace is designed to help us overcome, overcome evil, overcome our wrong mindsets. His grace is an empowerment to do the right thing. When you choose to do the right thing, he said, God, I choose to do the right thing, but I don't know how. He will come in with his grace and empower you to come out of that thing, out of that pit. But if you justify your state of being when you're in that pit, you cannot come out. You cannot come out of the pit yourself. 
without the grace of God and the power of God, you cannot come out of the pit of despair and all this stuff. All this garbage you cannot come out of unless you connect to Jesus and He gives you His grace to come out of that thing. You can ask for grace as often as you want and He still has grace for you. But if you want to start walking in God's favor, start obeying His commandments and walking in His ways, there is a difference. There is a huge difference. And if you find yourself not walking in His ways or not obeying some of His commandments, then you can ask for grace and ask for that power to come out of that thing and, and be empowered to, to do the right thing and walk in grace and walk in freedom. Walk in favor. Go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And then when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. I believe this was the disciples and a bunch of the others. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the resident, neither believed they them. So Jesus met these people walking to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, and they did not recognize him. Which means that he probably looked different. He probably had a counterfeit costume on. But he didn't look like Jesus to them. Until he started speaking or until the Lord opened their eyes and said, this was Jesus. And so if, if you know somebody that you've been walking with for three years and all at once this guy walks with you for miles and talks to you and you don't know it's him, that means he probably looked different, spoke different. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them for the, with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was ridden, risen. A- afterward, he appeared unto the eleven As they sat at meat, they were sitting down to eat, and he upbraided them. What does that mean? He upbraided them. I think he scolded them. That doesn't sound like a lamb. That sounds like a lion that has now risen. And he is saying, I've been with you three years. I told you all these things. Now the things happened, and now you act like this. What is wrong with you? He scolded them for their unbelief. He scolded them because they didn't believe the things that he had been talking to them about. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is right after. This is the verse right after he upbraided them. He scolded them for not believing And then he said, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. See, we we quote that, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But we hardly ever preach that just before that, he scolded them for unbelief. Can you imagine Jesus getting ready to leave, wondering what took and what didn't? in the disciples' lives. Peter had just denied him. (laughs) 
Say that in the mic. In the Strong's, the word upbraided is to defame, rail at, chide, taunt, revile. <laughs> we were in Israel a few times, and we have this Israeli guide that takes us around. And he, he helps us to understand a bigger picture of the culture of where they came from. But like the rabbis and the, when they're like in session, they don't just take turns to talk. They yell at each other. And, and uh, so this, this is the culture that we're talking about here. I believe he yelled at them. And, and uh, you know, we like to think of this this uh, sweet Jesus that, uh, you know, does all these nice things for people. But we also need to think about that Jesus has a mission that he wants to accomplish, and he will not accomplish it with, with everybody that gets their feelings hurt whenever something doesn't go their way. He, he, he needs people that will... Do his will even when it seems like he's not in control anymore. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world means go into all the world systems and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel means take the light of Jesus there. When you take the light of Jesus into a world system, it will either change to the ways of Jesus or it will radically react to the light. One or the other. And I believe that we are taking, we are taking the, we're preaching into all the world that corruption is not going to stand on our watch. When we got serious about that, and we got united with a few brothers on that, brothers and sisters on that, it looked like the world got worse. But I'm telling you, some of these corruption things that were happening for a hundred years or more are now in the news. It is not a conspiracy theory when it's in the news. It's actually happening. These things were happening for years, hidden, hidden away. We just shine the light. There's probably a bunch of Christians that got the same revelation at the same time, shine the light on this and said, not on our watch. It is not going to happen on our watch. We're shining the light on it. And the, the, the option that people have when the light gets shone on it is to either change and agree with the light or react against the light. But right now what the world system would like to do is cut off all, all believers. What they're trying to do is snuff out all the light. But I have not found it yet that darkness puts out light. Darkness can try to sell you a message to put out your light. Darkness can try to make you afraid. Darkness can try to make you run. Darkness can try to make you agree to turn out your light. To, to give up the connection of faith with God. If you walk through life in fear, you do not have the connection of faith with God. Faith and fear do not mix. You're either walking in faith with God or you're walking in fear with yourself. With the enemy. When you're walking in fear with yourself, you are not shining your light. You need a connection to turn on a light. The connection is faith. If you do not turn on faith and turn on your light with the connection of faith to God, you're going to be walking in darkness and you're going to be perpetuating darkness. When we walk in darkness, everything that comes out of our mouth is advancing darkness. When we are walking in the light, everything that comes out of our mouth is advancing light. It is 
that simple. When we turn the light switch off, the lights are off. When we turn the light switch on, the lights are on. In our life, it's that simple. We either have the light on with faith in God, connected to God, or we have the light off with a disconnection. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This is Jesus talking after the resurrection. This is Jesus talking to the disciples that he had discipled for three years. This is not, don't get all scared if you don't have the belief right now, but Focus on connecting to God because when we're connected to God, we will believe. Jesus is saying, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. He said, These signs shall follow them that believe. This is something to pay attention to, guys. This is something to pay attention to. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And then he qualifies, What does it mean? What are the signs of someone that believes? These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These are the signs of somebody that believes. In my name they shall cast out devils. In Jesus' name. That doesn't mean that we are walking in darkness and we scream in Jesus' name. That means that we are died to self, alive in Him, and we are submitted to Him and walking and flowing with Him to the point where we take on His identity. When we got married, my wife took my name, my last name. As an identity. When we connect to Jesus, we can connect to his identity. But that, that only works if it's done in the right flow. She can do things in my name with authority. But if she would just say in, my, in Jake Lapp's name, but she would do her own thing all the time, it would not work out the same. We can't do our own thing and they say in Jesus' name and when things don't happen, get mad at him for not doing his part. We need to actually be in his name, not just declare his name. That makes sense? If you say that you believe and things don't happen, then you go to God and ask Him, what am I missing? What's going on? And you can ask the people around you. But if you do that, be willing to hear what they have to say. If you actually want to know, be willing to hear what God has to say and be willing to hear what other people have to say. Because... Most of our experiences when people say, I don't know why this stuff's not happening. And if somebody starts saying what they're seeing, most of the time these people will fight back. And the way I understand things, if people start fighting back at that point, there is something there. Even if the person might not say it the right tone of voice that you want to hear or all this to make sure that you don't miss the gold in the middle of the manure. 
If someone is trying to hand you a gold bar and it is smeared in manure, take the gold bar, clean off the manure. You get rich. But if you decide, you know what, I am not receiving that gold bar until you clean off the manure, you're in bondage. There are so many gold nuggets and gold bars coming out of people that are wrapped in manure that if, if you would decide that you are going to receive that truth and wash off the manure, you could get a benefit from it. So then after the Lord had spoken unto him, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. They went everywhere, preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Acts 1, 4, and being assembled together with them, Jesus was together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking naturally yet. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And, and they were focused on what's going to happen here naturally. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I believe that it's important that the Holy Spirit empowers us before we go to the uttermost parts of the earth. If we, if we go there without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I believe our life could be in trouble. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven, so shall, shall so come like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Which to me means that he's coming back the same way he went. That means they saw him float and then there was a cloud that covered. I believe that the, there's going to be a cloud and then, whew, be a glorious day. Then returned they to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode Peter and James, John, Philip, Bart, all these people. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, this was the 50th day after Passover, I believe, after Jesus died. They were all with one accord in one place. In the Old Testament, in Psalms, I believe somewhere, it talks about that when brethren dwell together in unity, God commands a blessing. I believe that we want unity in Christ to the point where God commands a blessing. And I believe that this can be personally, 
It can be with a few people. It can be with a large group. But it has to be in one accord, in unity in Jesus, and then their God commands a blessing. Wouldn't that be awesome if we would be in such a place where God would command a blessing? If God commands a blessing, I expect a blessing, a powerful blessing. And so they were there. In one accord, in one place. And suddenly, and suddenly means that it was just monotonously going on the same and then change. Who believes for suddenly? Who believes that the next five minutes, this whole thing could be looking different? Suddenly. So we, we can get a belief system that our life was just monotonous just the same old, same old, and this is how it's always going to be. And project into our future exactly what we believe that our, our life's going to be based on our past. But what would happen if suddenly things would change? What would happen if, and suddenly, things changed? Do we believe for the suddenly? Or do we believe for the long, hard journey that we have experienced so far? If we believe for the long, hard journey that we have experienced so far, guess what we're going to speak into our future, and guess what we're going to meet in our future? If we decide, you know what, I believe God, and I believe that He can suddenly change things when the right conditions are met, and He commands a blessing, and suddenly things change. If we believe that, then we believe anything could happen. Literally anything. Can you imagine? No, you can't. What would unimaginable favor look like? <coughs> Try to imagine unimaginable favor. It's everything you can imagine and it's way beyond. And some of us might think, God, you don't even know how much we can imagine. Some of us have big imaginations and can imagine a lot of things. What about if it would go way beyond that? We're not even close to living in what God wants us to live in. I, I, huh? Wouldn't be the first time. What do you mean? It wouldn't be the first time that God would do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or think. I know, and, and I don't think it's the last time. How many of us believe that He can suddenly change it? That it can suddenly change? How many of us would be excited for that? Or how many of us believe that when God would suddenly change something, it would get worse? Uh, it would mess up our life. The question is, if God wants to mess up your life, is that a good thing? Yeah. See, we can, we can get stuck in this mindset believing that I, I got my life pretty much managed, but if God would come mess it up, then I would have to struggle and carry on trying to submit to Him once again. Why don't we decide that we're going to submit to Him even if He messes up our life? And then when it comes and we're happy, we go, we flow. We do what He wants to do next. What would happen if we would decide that now before that happens so that we don't have to waste a whole bunch of time trying to struggle and surrender and submit and die to self when that happens? Who wants to, who wants to, who, who wants to struggle while God is moving? I, yeah, what would happen? Yeah. I believe we would experience the hundredfold, we would experience the abundance, the unimaginable favor that God wants to pour out. But I believe that there are so many people that when God starts moving, they are still stuck in what they believed or what they thought would happen, and they are not okay with where God is taking this, and so they take a whole bunch of time trying to catch up, and by that time, God moved on to something else, or he's... or and. 
It's almost like, yeah, these people didn't miss the train, but they sure missed a whole bunch of glory in the meantime. It's not glorious to sit here trying to die to self when God is moving. Yeah, well, see, I, I believe that God has things going in many different waves, but which wave do we want to catch? Do we want to wait till the 20th one? When do we want to choose to trust God? When do we want to choose to walk with Him? When do we want to choose to move when He moves? Do we even believe He wants to move somewhere? I mean, I feel it. I feel it like God wants to do something. The enemy tries to act like he's in charge of, of the world right now and of people's minds and hearts and messing with their bodies with vaccines and all kinds of garbage. The enemy is not in charge of this life. God is. The question is, do we agree with God or not? Do we? Do we agree with God or not? <coughs> do we agree with God or not? Or do we go with the fear and what fear is trying to offer us right now? I believe that we can decide today what we're going to do when God suddenly shows up. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as, as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and begun to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They spoke other languages. They spoke, I don't know what they all spoke. They were dwelling, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when it was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in their own language. Can you imagine? Many different languages. Everybody heard this guys speak in their language. That's amazing. You think the miracle was in the hearing or the speaking? Probably both. I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere there was a divine interpretation and... And if God does it once, he can do it again. I've heard already that the latter rain is more powerful than the former. This was the former rain. I believe there's a latter rain that God wants to release that is much more powerful than what we're reading here in the Bible. Not only is one man going to the cross, dying to self for the sins of the world or for the sins of others, but we have a whole Millions and billions of people that can die to self. We can multiply this thing times billions if we get a hold of this concept. One man upset the world thinking. His desire is to multiply himself through the Holy Spirit, through us. Can you imagine the terror that the enemy is facing that we might get this principle? When we receive Jesus and, he, and we are clo we're hidden in him and we go about our business, in the spirit realm, the devil doesn't know if he's meeting you or if he's meeting Jesus. The only way he can tell is if he tests you and he finds a compromised spot in your life that you react to, then he knows it's not Jesus, it's you. Do you think that the devil wants to meet Jesus a billion times? He would be completely taken over. If we would get a hold of this concept of what Jesus actually talks about or wants to happen or what the resurrection actually is, the enemy's tactics would be over. I can imagine that. What does God have in store that I can't imagine? 
I have seen people change. When God came in, the enemy went out. I can imagine that on a big scale. What does God have in store that I can't imagine? I don't know. But I can imagine that. So they're speaking in different other languages and people were mocking and saying they're full of new wine. And so Peter stood up, lifted his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose it is the third hour of the day. This is, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that. He was refer referencing back to Joel, and now we're referencing back to Peter, back to Joel. We are about to hear Peter's sermon that he preached to these people that were freaked out that this stuff is happening and they didn't know how, what, what to do with it. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out on these days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means whoever will have faith in God and connect to Him, at that point their light shall come on. And they shall be saved. If people in that point freak out and are scared to the point where they do not trust God or connect to God, I don't think their light's going to come on. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the Determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not live my, leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with, thou con with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath of, to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus. Peter's talking to the crowd. 
God made Jesus Lord and Christ. Lord, it would be Master, Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what should we do? So they were convicted that they did wrong by crucifying Jesus and being in agreement with it. They said, what should we do? That's where the grace kicks in. Grace would kick it when, when you're like, God, what should I do? I want to do the right thing. I don't know. I don't, I don't even understand what's going on all the time. But I want to do the right thing. That's where grace kicks in. You don't have to understand it for grace to kick in. When you understand it, you don't need grace. When you choose God and you don't understand, that's where the power of grace can take you to the next level. But we have to choose God. Do not try to apply grace to your life before you choose God. That is not grace. That is asking God to compromise. If you want God's grace without connecting to God, you would really like God to compromise on your behalf in your life. Yes. If you choose to not want to know truth, you want to stay in grace but not responsibility, but that is not God's plan. God's plan is that we take responsibility and then grace takes us to wherever he wants us to go. Can you grow in grace? Can you grow in grace? I would say so. I would. The question was, can you grow in grace? Yeah, you can spiritually mature as you tap off of grace. Yeah. Is there different types of grace? I'm sure there is. Because I think the Bible says, can you grow in grace? Yeah, I believe that the, that we can grow in grace, but that would mean that would mean that we have our yes with God. And we ask God for, we, we, we operate off the power that God has to help us mature and to help us come to where he can use us. When we plateau and say, God, you know what, my life's pretty good, I don't want to go any further, I think we're good, then, but God give me grace to stay right here. He might give us grace at that point to try our thing, but, but that's not his, that's not your suddenly. That might be your long, hard journey that you then blame on him. Yes. 2 Peter 3.18. Read. Read it. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I have a practical demonstration of that. Uh, some years ago, I was on my journey. It's before I came to a full knowledge of salvation, but I was on a journey, and I was reading and studying God's Word because I wanted to know what He's teaching us and what He's saying. And I came across some verses that I could not grasp with my mind. And I, I rejected the word. I pushed the Bible across my desk and I just, I can't get it. That's just, that's wrong. That's wrong. And the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly and said, that's the word of God. Almost like, like the lion would speak. It wasn't like, son, I'm leading you. It was, that's the word of God. It was strong. And I chose to reach out and pull the Bible back and study it again, read it again, reread it. I still couldn't get it. Finally, I closed it and I said, God, I don't understand what your word is saying, but I'm choosing to believe that it's true, what you just said. 
and I walked away in peace. It went about two weeks until I got a full understanding of that principle that I was wrestling with. In that two-week period, I was walking in grace. I still didn't understand what he was trying to teach me, but I had chosen to believe that what that word says is true. There was a work to be done one way or another somehow, but had I, had I, had I not listened to that chiding voice when it said, that's the word of God, if I had just stayed in that state, I don't believe I'd understand that principle today yet. And I don't know how much grace is for that. If you choose to disobey God's word, choose to, d- to reject it like I did there. But I, within seconds, reached back out and said, Lord, I know this is true somehow. That's living in grace, walking in grace, and then he moves and gives us understanding. I believe that growing in grace is that grace growing in us to give us the ability to go there. And that when we choose to not, we don't grow in grace. And so I believe that as this grace grows in us, we get the understanding and then we, then we can step into favor. But we need grace while we're going through that journey. But that grace is not so that we can live in sin. That grace is so we can get out of it. I, I came across that verse is it growing grace or walking grace? Growing grace. In my uh, uh, personal Bible reading for myself, and what it meant for me was that uh, it, the growing in grace means just as much grow in grace as far as being able to, to give grace. It's not just growing in grace as receiving grace. It's also being able to have grace. That is also growing in grace. Yes. Once I believe that once we receive grace in a certain area, we can also extend grace in that area to others. As we grow in grace, if we still have a challenge extending grace to others, I would guess that we have not received grace in that place of our heart ourselves yet. And we're trying to extend grace to others in an area where we might be dark yet ourselves. Can we grow in grace and have a no before God? Can we grow in grace and have a no before God? I was 19 years old, living in sin, and there were people praying for me, praying that I would surrender my life to Christ, praying that I would repent of that wickedness. And I, at one point, I... I went on a walk. I took a walk out into the woods. My dad has had over 100 acres, and I had just roamed the woods and just loved nature. I remember standing on a hill, come walking down over it, stopping there in the hill, just looking around, and suddenly a voice spoke to me right here behind my right ear. And the voice said, get down on your knees right here and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And another voice on this side said, no, don't do that. You don't want to do that. And so this argument went back and forth. It was this voice speaking on the right side behind this ear, and then another voice speaking on the left side behind this ear. And after a bit, my mind was in the middle, arguing with itself and arguing with either, either one or the other, other voice. But at one point, I hardened my heart. I said no to the voice on the right side, which I know was the Holy Spirit. And I, I believed and gave in to the voice on the left. For one year, I walked in that dangerous, dangerous spot. I believe had I had an accident or had I fallen on a job site and been killed instantly, I would have no hope for eternal, heaven in, eternal life in heaven. I lived under a form of grace a lot that year. Did I know I was living? Did I know what at the time? I knew I was living in a dangerous spot and I did not care. I wasn't looking for grace. I wasn't looking for favor. I knew where I stood. That's why I'm saying there are times when somebody else is interceding in a very powerful way, and God's grace will cover you. That's where I was. 
Because of the intercessory prayer, yes. Because of the intercessory prayer, I was covered. But you were not in grace. I was not growing in grace. I had turned my back on God, and I knew I had done it. There was no question in my mind what voice was speaking into this ear. I knew it was the voice of God. No, I didn't. I hardened my heart. I remember feeling my heart hardened standing on that hill. I remember it. And I knew what I had just done, and I knew what just happened. God's grace is big. Could I have continued in that year after year after year? I don't know. I know that I didn't. Because a year later when the call came, I did surrender. It could. So the last question here was the people asked, what should we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, which is all of us. It's interesting that the first thing Peter said was repent. The first thing that John the Baptist said, repent. And Jesus said, repent. Repent means... Take responsibility for what you did wrong. Forgive means releasing somebody else that did you wrong. But if you really look at it, if somebody did you wrong, and you did not take that to God, and you developed an attitude, at some point you need to repent of that attitude that you believe somebody else caused. But you choose if you're going to pick up a bad attitude or if you're not. The shield of faith that it talks about in Ephesians 6, the shield of faith will quench, does it say 80% of the fiery darts? The shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts that come against you, if we have faith, if we have our connection with God, with Jesus, and our light is shining, we will be able to quench every single fiery dart that comes against us. If a dart slips through and hits our heart, we have a choice to either repent for not being in faith or to blame somebody for doing something against us. We have a choice. If a fiery dart hits my heart, I have to believe that I did not have my shield of faith up. Are you tracking? If I have my shield of faith up, if I'm connected to God and I'm filled with His light, and a fiery dart hits my heart, I either have to believe that some fairy darts can hit me, or I have to believe that in some area I did not have faith, a shield of faith. At that point, I can whine and complain and blame and get bitter, or I can repent for not trusting God and walking in faith. We have a lot more power to overcome these things that come against us and what we think. We need to be reminded and lined up every so often, maybe. But we have power to overcome. We have power to overcome every bit of darkness that comes against us or is around us. If we believe this, we will look for answers when something doesn't seem to be working 
And we, will, we, we can say, Lord, I don't understand this, but I still choose you. I still choose to trust you. And I ask for the grace to overcome this and to learn it and to believe it and to, and to walk in it. Or we can just stay in the mully grubs and complain and whine and bitter and, and rejection and, and depression, all these things. All that stuff is darkness. All that stuff is garbage. Don't justify it. Well, the doctor said this, or the doctor said that. The doctor just told you that you have darkness. If the doctor says that something's wrong with you, that means he is confirming that you're walking in darkness. There is no darkness that overcomes light. There, and... and you know, people can get offended with this message, but I'm telling you, this is an opportunity to come out of that darkness. We either have to believe that Jesus didn't, didn't finish everything at the cross, or we, or we can believe that maybe we're not connected to him at some point. But if we justify negativity and darkness in our life, we are coming into agreement with the enemy. doesn't matter how it looks in your life. It doesn't matter what's happening. God has the answer. God is the answer. And we can run to God. If we run to anything else, if we run to depression, if we run to bitterness, if we run to anger, if we run to all this stuff that is not from God, then we are saying and declaring that we trust this stuff above God. And I'm telling you that stuff is darkness and it will not produce light ever. We can run to God and we can tell God that I don't understand what's going on, but I'm still with you. And I'm still committed to the light. And then watch suddenly happen. It works. I've experienced it many times. I know the battle. But I'm telling you, it works. And suddenly, things change. 